The evangelist usually is an exhorter. The used car salesman. <laughs> oh, why am I? Not that there's any comparison between those various types. OK, no, 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 we won't go there. Um, interestingly enough, even when the exhorter is talking to a huge crowd, he's still focusing on the one person. Billy Graham, exhorter. He would pick out one person in the audience and talk to that one person. That's who he's focusing on. Okay? It's different than the contributor. The contributor's not that way. Exhorter focuses on the one person. Why? Because he ties together mercy. Mercy deals with individual experiences, individual people. Okay? Not a detailed person. Detail comes to the rest of the mind. Okay. When you move, it's your exhorter part does this first thing. The first movement is your contributor part that says, oh, okay, there, now I'm there. Now, interestingly enough, we'll see later, um, in Parkinson's disease, this part is paralyzed. The exhorter part is paralyzed. It happens to be the, the, the brain chemical dopamine. It goes dead. Substantia nigra pars compacta. Um, and the exhorter person, the person with Parkinson's disease, cannot handle these transitions. He cannot do the initial movements. He has real problems there. He has to do it all fine-tuned. Okay? Getting from here to there, starting to do some, is really hard because it's paralyzed in the Parkinson's patient. The exhorter person, he's great at starting things with beautiful letterhead. <laughs> what? We need something on the shelf? Oh, oh. details, minor details. Hates red tape. Yes, Winston Churchill. He was an exhorter person. I, by the way, Winston Churchill probably had the most influence on this country and this whole situation in the Mideast, than any more influence than anybody else. But um, hates he. One of his uh, the things he did in the civil um, British civil service is he had it changed so that when they in their correspondence instead of writing the answer is in the affirmative, they would write yes. That was his way of cutting red tape. Um, the exhorter hates red tape. Hates, hates, hates. OK. Good at handling crisis may create one. We already talked about that. <laughs> um, he almost is a crisis. <laughs> Just his existence. Contributor. The contributor is the bottom line person. Now, if you think of the, ex think of the exhorter as the horse and the contributor as the rider on the horse. The horse gallops after whatever emotion there is. This is exciting. This is a, oh, there's excitement here. Let's run after it. Oh, there's excitement here. You know, wherever the, the most exciting thing, the exhorter's always doing it, right? So what he, wherever he's doing is by definition the most exciting. Because if anything else came along that were more exciting, he would stop doing this and do the thing that's <laughs> the most exciting, right? Okay, that's the undisciplined exhorter. In discipline, he can learn to really stick with something. But, yeah, okay. The exhorter is like the horse. The contributor is like the rider on the horse. The contributor person needs to be driven by imagination. He needs to have gas in his pump. And his gas is the exhorter part, which is subconscious in him. Okay? But he is, isn't the gas. He's the controller. He's the decider. He is in charge. He makes the decisions. For him, these words, business, good business words, that's how he thinks, cost and benefit. If I do this, what will be the benefit? If I do this, what will be the result? Okay? What will happen? This and this. And, um, contingency planning. If this goes wrong, oh, then I'll do this. If this goes wrong, I'll do this. If this, this, then I'll do this. That's contributor thinking. Um, sowing and reaping, I put in an investment here, I get a dividend here, contributor thought. Investment and dividend, the bottom line. Now here's a very interesting thing. What is the bottom line? For the average contributor in this world, the bottom line is money. Right? Uh, is that a good bottom line? It's quite boring, yeah. Um, it can be. The bottom line. The bottom line. To me, the final straw. It's the one you're going for. It's the, it's, it's, the, it's, it's the goal you want to reach. 
what will often happen with a contributor is they'll pick some bottom line, they'll run after it, and they'll achieve it, and then they'll suddenly feel, find out, whoops, I'm at the top of the ladder, and I climbed the wrong building. <laughs> Mid-life crisis! What the contributor needs to do, the contributor person, if they took time before they started climbing ladders, if they took time to develop the rest of their mind, to learn facts, to develop their mercy part, to learn feelings, to get some understanding, to gain some skills, then they can start sniffing out and finding out which is the better building to work after. Look at the sort of things Jesus talked about. It's all bottom line thinking. Whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You know, what profits is a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? It's all bottom line thinking. It's all this type of thinking. But what's his bottom line? Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame. Right? He did it for the goal. But his goal was eternal. Had eternal significance and eternal value. It was a personal goal. He climbed the right tree. He climbed the right ladder. Okay? Huh. Love's confidence. Now, the exhorter ties together, let me use a different color here. Exhorter ties together teacher and mercy. The contributor ties together perceiver and server. The example I like to use is Sherlock Holmes. Didn't exist, but Arthur Conan Doyle, of course, was a contributor, the author. Takes his magnifying glass. What happened here? Oh, we have a sequence. Let me examine this sequence. Oh, oh, this happened there. Oh, oh, very interesting. You see, server. Then he goes home, pulls out his pipe, back when pipe, pipes weren't politically incorrect, and comes up with ideas. How could this, these actions be connected together with these ideas? See, connection between what happened and, and the facts. Now, perceiver person, he's Mr. Facts, Mr. Rules, Mr. Truth. For the contributor person, truth is not true unless it's applied. A rule is not a rule unless it's enforced. There has to be an action associated with the facts. Okay? It's the combination, just like the exhorter. It's not the experience that counts, it's the lesson you learn from life. It's not the theory that counts, it's the way you can apply the theory in real life. Now, I should say one other thing. This is a kind of an iffy connection. It's kind of wishy-washy emotional. There's no specific in it. It's kind of this theory. You can tell it from the standard exhorter, his theories. It's what I call proof by example. It happens once. It happened once. Therefore, it must happen all the time. Mm, sometimes. It's not very scientific. Whereas this, the, the, the contributor person, much more scientific. It's not just an emotional connection. It's uh, this fact specifically is connected with this action. Well, um, it also happens to be in grammar. Um, it, this is the part that, ha that deals with uh, meanings of words. But that's, that's a little bit too complicated. I won't get into that. Uh, where are we? Fears and anxieties. Aha. You see, here's the horse. There's the rider on the horse. The information comes from the, exa uh, the exhorter person. It comes, let's put an arrow here. It goes down like that. The contributor person has his imagination, his excitement. Now, what happens if this one works with excitement? Does excitement care whether it's good or bad? No. It's exciting. So the contributor person is living in this room. His exhorter part suddenly says, this horrible thing could happen. I'm flying on a plane. We could crash. What am I going to do? I can't do anything. I don't know what to do. The fears and anxieties. Okay? And that is a price that the contributor pays with the creative contributor. There's, there's, there are several flavors of contributor. One flavor of contributor is the controlling contributor. He's got blinkers on. His horse has no freedom. His exhorter part, no freedom. Imagination will not go. I will not allow it to go anywhere. I am in control. Okay? He has no fears and anxieties and he has no creativity. Okay? Then you get the artistic, the creative, the imaginative contributor. He pays the price. He lets his horse run where it wants, but he can't control where it's going to run. Sometimes it's going to run after things that are unpleasant. So there's a, there's a price to pay. Then you have to deal with situations at a higher level. That's, 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 a, that's a whole other topic. 
likes, ah, likes challenge and adventure. Okay, let's look at this horse and rider thing. Now, let's say that this is a nice big plain. I'm standing in the middle of the, of, the, of the field. And the horse, there's nothing around for the horse. Is that horse going to run anywhere? No. Is the contributor person going to have any excitement? No. Is it going to have any energy? No. It's going to have no motivation to do anything. Now, what happens if this glass covering the well is gone and I could fall in? Woohoo! It's exciting. You see, now the contributor person has energy because something horrible could happen. So the contributor person likes to operate on the edge, pardon my drawing, the edge of the cliff. Not over the cliff, that's losing control, that's horrid. Not in the middle, that's boring, there's no excitement on the edge. Okay? And this may be a Figurative ed edge, it may be a real edge. The guy who climbs up the vertical face of a cliff, he's probably the contributor person. Chances are that, he, that he's that type. Okay? He wants to be, that's one way that he satisfies, gets, maintains control plus excitement, walking on the edge. So that's the challenge and adventure. Bothered by small talk, small expenses. Um, he thinks in terms of value. Okay, small talk, there's nothing exciting. Uh, the contribu average contributor has developed ways of avoiding small talk, of getting out of boring conversations. He's developed the techniques. He really knows how to avoid that. And also another thing is, let's say a contributor person really values money. That's his bottom line. That's what he's going for. Do you think he's going to think something like this is useful? No. It's worthless. For him, it's small talk. It's, it's nothing. Because he's not climbing this, this building. He's climbing another building. So you have a whole set of values being imposed upon environments by contributor people. And contributor people, because they're in control, they make all the money, most of the money. They, they're, they're the athletes with lots of the money. They're the, they're the astronauts. They're the businessmen. They're the one who, who controls society. And do you think they're going to go for anything of lasting significance? Probably not. Why? Because, like everyone, they develop their part, but not the rest of it. It's the rest of the mind that gets, helps this part come up with an intelligent bottom line, proper values, real skills, legitimate understanding. But this person, no, he's too busy climbing the easiest ladder until he gets to the top and he finds that he doesn't like it there, and it's meaningless. Hmm? Midlife crisis. Incredible potential, the right stuff. That's a book about contributors, the right stuff. The, at risk, at, the, um, that, uh, that, the book about the astronauts. A winner, he hates losing. He hates losing. Do I need to say that again? He loves winning. If he, will, he will usually narrow down to some area where he can be a winner. And if something is outside of his area of expertise, he may actually just ignore it. Like my dear, dear sister, contributor person, um, for years she didn't know anything about how to use a computer. It wasn't important. Huh? It's not her area of expertise. Suddenly it became important. So then, you know, now she has to struggle with it. She's doing okay. But it's that's a struggle with the contributor. They narrow down to their area of expertise. Anything else is not important. Believer in faith, for the exhorter, it's hope. For the contributor, it's faith. Or fate. Positive thinking, yeah. There's a whole other topic. Can I just ask a question? Sure. On the panel, you said that it was they're both. Um, they're both, let me give, I'm thinking of two examples. Number one, what often happens, think of Bill Gates, contributor person, very rich, extremely selfish to the point of wiping out anybody who dares to oppose him. But now that he's rich, he's giving away billions to various charities. Do you see? There's both that combination of stingy and generous. Another way it can happen is um, they, will help, they love helping someone who's down and out because that person doesn't threaten them. So they will help someone until that person reaches about their knee level. And then they'll knock them down again. You see? Sorry? 
that's the contributor. Because it's this combination of real generous, they love to help others. They love to, um, to, to, to yeah, to, to improve the lot of others. But they also want to be a winner. So it's that struggle between the two. Yeah, yes. Mm-hmm. In or single-minded, yeah. Say, yeah. In achieving their goals, right. But having made the money, having achieved the goals, whatever it may be, it may be money, yeah. It may be power. Like That's yes. But then, when they want to go down in history, yeah. As the very nice, generous person, yes. Then they build things like Henry VIII did, who. Bad things, but went down in history for some people. Yeah. Very okay. It, it, it's, it's related to this thing of climbing the ladder up to get to the top of one building and then saying, hmm, maybe I don't want to be at the top of that building. Maybe that's not the sort of person I want. I want to get to that building. Yeah, well, hmm. How do you jump? This selfishness thing is a whole huge topic, and I don't really have time to get into it. But there's a whole thing of, of Christianity and, and personal transformation. You know, you could talk for hours about selfishness. I'm just going to have to leave that one. Um, how are we doing? Okay, hey, facilitator. This is the last one. Um, it's stage three in this pump. I'll show you. We'll, we'll tie it together later. Um, Exhorter person, exhorter part does what? Review. Hmm? Excitement, energy. Sorry? Good communicator. Leading, pushes, prods, starts. Contributor part improves, decides, controls. Facilitator person part adjusts fine tunes, a little bit more of this, a little less of this. Um, let's round it off a little bit. Let's make it a little easier this way. Let's just adjust. So often you will get a contributor president with a facilitator executive secretary. Exhorter and contributor, very common marriage. Contributor and facilitator, very common marriage. Exhorter and facilitator, less common. It exists, but you don't find it that often. Okay. Adaptable, diplomatic, polite. Diplomatic, now, this sort of diplomatic is different than the mercy etiquette. The mercy etiquette says, I want to make you feel good. Diplomatic is, I don't do things extreme. The facilitator hates extremes. He wants to be in the middle because he wants to fine tune. So, guess what happens when the facilitator finds himself involved in an exhorter led project? The exhorter, of course, loves extremes. Let's go to something new. Facilitator, whoa, this is exciting. Oh, great. Whoa, where am I? How did I get here? No, I don't want to be here. <laughs> and so often, the average facilitator has several um, bad cult experiences where he gets involved in something, either a real cult or something like a cult because he wants the excitement, the energy, and then he realizes it's an extreme, and then he uses his adjustment to, to his ability to adjust things to say, oops, we got a zero off. All those, those levels go to zero. I'm out of here. The facilitator person will also often regard, especially the, the secular one, will often regard his childhood as a bad cult experience. Okay? I wipe it off, I start with a clean slate, and guess what? I'm going to control education so that nobody is given any strong opinions, nobody is taught any truth, nobody is taught anything dogmatic, because I don't want, because I had to, it was a bad cult experience, and it's bad. Okay? So, facilitator often ends up, they are the ones who have produced the educational system we have today which is valueless because they want to make sure that, that nobody pulls them into extreme and nobody put, pulls society into an extreme. It's very interesting. Want stability and order. Now, there's a weird combination there. 
If nothing changes, the facilitator says, I want freedom. If there's total openness, like exhorter led something, the facilitator said, this is chaos, we need order. Okay, so give them chaos, they cry for structure. Give them structure, they cry for freedom. It's this weird thing. They need some freedom within a structure. So what, when the facilitator person is in charge of something and if he uses only his part of the brain, what will happen is there will be continual small change, but never any real movement. Okay? Small adjustment, but never any real change. Um, that's when the facilitator part works by itself. Now, let's, let's say some good things about the facilitator. Solomon was a facilitator. The wisdom. All these little pithy proverbs. That's what the facilitator is really good at. Um, and most um, psychologists, most scientists, a lot of science, science was started by facilitators. The, the experimental method. Let's keep everything the same, but let's adjust this one thing and measure it. That's facilitator thought. It's very helpful. Um, libraries started and organized by facilitators at fine tuning. Um, analyzes himself. Facilitator is really weird because they're the secretary of the mind. They watch themselves going through life. They can see all these six other parts. Why do you think I did that one last? They can see all of them, but they can't see what's happening. They can see the information. It's like all these memos from all the departments are passing through their desk across their desk, through their office. Oh, we need to change this. Oh, um, um, this department, exhorter department, requests, requests more information. Okay, we adjust that one a bit more. Uh, perceiver part, we went a little more, you see? That's how they think. That's how they operate in an, uh, externally too. Hates the repetitive, they like small change. Excellent administrator, connecting people in projects. Okay, that's where they're really good at, getting this person connected with that person, connecting with that person to do a project. Very good at that. Thousands of close friends they have. Really. Because they're adjustable. They're, uh, they, they're adaptable. When they are with a person, then they're a close friend of that person. When they're with another person, then they're, another close, they're a close friend of that person. Um, in fact, they want often the stability. And that's where the rest of the mind, the perceiver part, provides the stability. You know, the server part provides the, the continuity. Uh, a verbal, analytical thinking, thinker yet emotional. Poetry, big thing for a facilitator. Words and feelings. Okay, let's take a five minute break so I can uh, gather my thoughts and um, dry my mouth or wet my mouth or whatever. And, um, and then we'll go on for our probably, um, good. How to figure out what you are. With some people, it's totally obvious. Other people, it's, people, it's a little harder. Um, at certain societies, you cannot figure out what people are. Like you go to an African society, how can you, or go back 200 years, how could you tell what a lot of the people were? Because they didn't develop themselves. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> it's spitting. How do we turn this off? That'll do it. <laughs> okay, let's, um, let's try this again. How do you figure out what you are? In a certain society, it's hard to do it. You can only figure out what you, you are if your society is sufficiently individualistic to allow you to become yourself. Okay? If you live in a very strongly cultural society, something like Japan, how can you figure out what you are? It's really hard. Um, so, let's assume that there are individuals, that you're allowed to become yourself. Usually, you can cross off about four, three or four of them. You can say, I know I'm not this, I know I'm not this, I know I'm not that. Get rid of them. So then you can re almost always reduce it to either two, one of two, or three. Okay? Then what you have to do is compare those and say, which one's the real me? Which one is the me that came, say, from my parents? 
or the me that came from my society or my culture or the decisions I've made. And sometimes you can get it pretty well right away. Sometimes it may take a little longer. Um, there is a test that's reasonably good. It's, it's not possible to make it perfect because we're no, not looking here at how you, how you behave, how you appear. That's not what we're looking at. We're looking at what's the real you? What's conscious? Where do you live? What's the room that's you? Okay, and that's harder to figure out. But if you go to the site www.cognitivestyles.com, www.cognitivestyles.com, there's thousands of pages of information on this, uh, including a test to try to help you figure out what you are. All right. So hopefully that'll help. Uh, now, I alluded to this diagram. What we've done so far was, is just descriptive. I haven't gone into the theory much. We're now going to go into theory and societal application and other areas where this applies. So far, what we've talked about is basically a glorified version of what you'll get in most theories, most seminars on spiritual gifts. This stuff is new research. It's all, it's all original with us. Okay. That is the diagram, the magic diagram. Now, me being a school teacher, guess what I'm going to make you do tomorrow night? I'm not going to mark it. I'm not going to collect it. Nobody else is going to see it. But I, I want you to write this out by memory. Okay? Because this is the di diagram that ties everything together. It is the big universal theory. Okay? It will make your teacher part happy. Both. Well said. <laughs> I will feel good because I will have imposed order upon the audience, and you will feel good because you will have something to tie something together. Seriously though, this, this um, actually corresponds to brain regions. This is, this is a, a simple map of how the brain is wired. Okay? Let's look at this. Yeah, let's get a pointer. Left hemisphere. This is the left hemisphere. Analytical thought. Analytical thought has to do with structure, how things fit together. It's A, B, C, D, E, F. It's doing this, then this, then this. It's doing following the recipe. It's building a wall. That's analytical thought. It's left hemisphere. Associative thought is right hemisphere. It's one thing reminds you of another. It's connections. It's this is like this. It's this is beside this. It's, it's not temporal. Analytical is temporal, time-oriented. Associative is space-oriented, spatial. Temporal, spatial. So left hemisphere, right hemisphere. These are the four simple styles. Two ways of operating. We looked at emotion. The teacher and the mercy are emotional. Teacher is left hemisphere emotion. Mercy is, hey, I think I can do it better here. Mercy is right hemisphere emotion. Server and perceiver are confidence. Server is confidence in action, left hemisphere confidence. Perceiver is confidence in facts, right hemisphere confidence. So these four, mercy, perceiver, teacher, server, those are in the cortex. There are four brain processors. You know how a, a, a computer has a CPU in it? The brain that does the actual thinking? Well, there happen to be four brain CPUs. They're called the... Do I have it labeled here? No. I'll write it down here. There's the amyg, amygdala. Fancy name. It just means it's just a Latin term for almond-shaped or almond, because it's almond shaped. And there is the hippocampus. Why? Because it looks like a horse. Don't let these terms fool you. Mm -hmm. They sound complicated because they're Latin. They're not. In amygdala, there's one in each brain right there. Uh, one, sorry, one in each hemisphere, two in each brain. Hippocampus, um, it's a little further back. These are 
emotional processors. That's not me saying that, that's brain literature, that's neurology. You look at neurology, they will tell you the amygdala are the parts that process emotions. Now, the, the literature, as far as I know, will not distinguish very well between left and right hemisphere emotion. That's original with us. But the fact that these two are emotional processors, you lose them. You, you get them taken out of your brain. Why would they do that? Sometimes to control epilepsy. You cannot, your ability to process emotions, feelings, is drastically reduced. Hmm, scary, isn't it? Hippocampus. These, lobotomy is a different thing. That has to do with the frontal lobes. Okay? Uh, and we'll look at that later. Hippocampus, the, there, again, there are two in each, hem, one in each hemisphere, two in each brain. You got two of each of these, you got two of these, and two of these. This is the knowing processor. The one in the left has to do with knowing sequences, verbal knowing. The one in the right has to do with spatial knowing. That's not me. That's neurology telling us. You look at neurological literature, they will tell you that, to that extent. Okay? These are the processors. Your, C, your brain CPUs that have to do with teacher, server, mercy, and perceiver. Okay? They're in the cortex. There was this famous guy called H.M. I don't know what, his in, what those initials stay, stand for. Fifty years ago, in order to, re, to uh, cure his epilepsy, they removed <coughs> this. Big mistake. He is, he, after that, he was unable to learn anything new. Every time he saw you, it would be like for the first time. Okay? Unable to form any, learn anything new. Um, a little bit new, but that has to do with, with um, cerebellum. That's another story. But yeah, then they, that's when they learned how important these things are. They don't do those sorts of operations anymore. Okay. Thankfully. Okay. These three are in the subcortex. Sub, sub means under, cortex, cortex. Good Latin word. I think it's bark, isn't it? It's just the part that's on the outside. The, the wrinkled part. Three stages of a pump. Exhorter. What does the exhorter do? Review, review. Exhorter. Excitement. Excitement pushes, prods, energy. Good. Thank you. Next stage is contributor, which Control. controls, decides, chooses, optimizes, improves. Facilitator. Fine tunes, adjusts, sees the whole thing. Thinks sees all of them. He isn't. He's the observer. Okay? That's the three stages. The exhorter ties together the teacher and mercy. The contributor ties together the server and perceiver. Now, that explains these arrows, flow of information. These solid lines, the exhorter ties together teacher and mercy. Solid lines, contributor ties together server and perceiver. That explains that. Why these arrows from teacher to server, mercy to perceiver? It's the interplay between feeling and knowing, between emotion and confidence. Remember, we talked about that. Okay? Perceiver thinks he knows the truth. He knows um, this is true. But what happens when emo an emotional situation comes up? Does he still know it's true? You see? That's one thing. Also, a uh, perceiver works by tying together mercy experiences. We'll look at that in a moment. Okay. So that's th we've got two types of thinking, two types of information, left hemisphere, right hemisphere. We've got one other thing. Notice these two are abstract. Perceiver and teacher are abstract. They deal with information. They're the theoretical types. Server and mercy are concrete. They deal with experiences, doing. Okay. So what do we have here? Two ways of thinking. Left, right hemisphere, two types of memory, abstract, concrete. The simple styles, they're the ones in the cortex. Composite styles in the subcortex. Anything? Yes. You've got all of them. Unless you had a brain lobotomy, you have all of them in your brain. Okay? If a person does have brain damage, he may be missing one of these. <laughs> Actually true. It's sad, but true. Huh? Now, is this your spirit? No. This is the computer that, that jump starts your spirit. You see, your spirit is the invisible part. It's the non-physical part. The brain is physical. 
When you start out life, you got a brain. It's wired. There's nothing in it. The computer's there, but nobody's home. Okay? As you grow up, this is like the scaffolding that grows your spirit, that develops your spirit. When you die, the brain goes, gone. What's left is your spirit. Now, when you're alive, you've got all this machinery to help you develop, grow your, your non-substantial part, your spiritual part. Okay? When you die, that help is gone. That's why it's so important to do your change now while you've got the computer. Hmm? Try doing major rebuilding without that computer. It's pretty hard. That's called being dead. Hmm? That's why it's so important to do it now. Now, for example, what happens when you're drunk? Is there anything inside? No. Your, your body is holding your brain together, so to speak. Your body is holding your spirit together. That's exactly what you don't want to do. You don't want to do that sort of stuff. You want to, as much as possible on this earth, build something inside using the, the computer that God gave you so that you've got something of value to take when the computer turns to dust. Okay. So, the one mode in which you're conscious, there's a certain, you, like, I'm a perceiver part, perceiver person, I'm conscious in the perceiver part. So, if I'm a perceiver part, what can I see? Well, I can see mercy experiences, because there's an aerial there. So, so Spock, remember, he had a mercy, he had a human mother. I can, I'm kind of aware of decisions next door, but this stuff, that's subconscious for me. I can't see it. Mercy person, what can he see? He can kind of see excitement. All the rest is his subconscious. It bubbles up from the surface. Contributor, he can see lots. He gets the exhorter, he gets the server, he gets the perceiver, he gets the mercy through the imagination, the teacher through imagination. He's at the center, he can control lots. Facilitator sees the whole thing. But what happened is, is everybody, if you add up how much you see and how much you can think, so to speak, it's a constant. So the facilitator finds it hard to do the in-depth thought. He needs his subconscious a lot. The, the person who's really good at the in-depth thought is the teacher or the mercy, but they don't see much of the rest of their mind. It's always, it's a balance. Mm -hmm. Some people are, are it's, you know. Any questions on this? Like I said, um, I will ask you at the beginning of tomorrow just to write this off from memory, just because this is the thing that ties everything together. Okay? I won't mark it. I won't look at it. It's just for your benefit. I'll be nice. No yellow slips. Okay. Um, now, how are we doing? Yes, I want to start looking at something else which relates to it. How many of you are familiar with Myers-Briggs, MBTI? Okay. There are other schemes of cognitive styles, other methods of slicing humanity into various pie shapes. Okay? Which was the best one? Well, okay. Let's say I want to figure out how a computer works. What's more basic? Software or hardware? The programs you run or the physical machine? The hardware is more basic. Okay? So, if a system of cognitive styles corresponds to hardware, it's probably more basic than one which doesn't. Do you understand what I'm saying? As far as I know, this is the only one the, uh, the one that we're looking at now with the seven is the only one where you can say that it corresponds to brain areas. I don't know of any other system that, that claim, makes that claim. Um, so, and also, it's the only one that happens to come from the Bible. So for two reasons, I would suggest that this one is more basic. It doesn't mean that the other ones are wrong. They're useful. But it's just in the same way that hardware is more basic than software, so then I suggest that this one's more basic. I'd like to look at the most common one, Myers-Briggs. Um, <clears throat> now, Myers-Briggs, there is a problem with these two systems because Myers-Briggs has its own labels and uh, what I call mental symmetry, that's what we call this one, um, has its different set of labels. 
So we've got uh, uh, different letters. Mm. We'll just have to go over this briefly. In essence, Myers-Briggs has four divisions, four splits. So you've got four walls, this and this, this and this, this and this, and this and this. That leads to 16 combinations. Okay? You're one of these, one of these, one of these, one of these. Okay? 16 combinations. Let's look, I'm not going to look at it in detail, but I want to look at the basic categories and see how that relates. Can, can, we, can I explain that theory? You see, other theories aren't wrong. I should be able to under, we should be able to understand them. They should be useful. Okay. The Myers-Briggs, the, the four splits are divided into two categories. Two have to do with personal life. Two have to do with groups of people. Two with individuals. Two with corporate. Okay, let's look at the two individual ones. First one is thinking versus feeling. Uh, and these labels are not mine, they're Myers-Briggs, which came uh, from these guys called Myers and Briggs, two guys, and originally came from Carl Jung. Carl Jung. Okay, so it's, it's not a Christian source. We'll see the results of that. Thinking versus feeling. Thinking is your head. Feeling is your heart. Thinking is the facts. Feeling is emotions. Now, what does that remind you of? Which two cognitive styles? Mercy and perceiver. So to a first approximation, when you think of thinking, you think perceiving. Perceiver. When you think of feeling, you think mercy. To a first approximation, there's correspondence there. But there's a difference. Perceiver and mercy are looking at parts of the brain that are working, rooms that live. This is looking at walls that divide. You are thinking, but not feeling. You are feeling, but not thinking. You see, one or the other. That's a different sort of stuff. It's hard to build life on walls. We know that, right? So rooms work. It's much easier to live in rooms than in walls. Um, now, perceiving, judging. Perceiving is fun, it's freedom, it's no rules. Judging is control, it's getting finished, it's having things limited. Okay, now what does that remind you of? What dichotomy? Exhorter and contributor maybe. Okay, to a first approximation, okay? But, now, what does the Bible say about these? Interesting. Okay? Cognitive styles, the ones we're looking at, comes from Romans 12. What does the Bible say about these divisions? Well, Jeremiah 31, 33. Um, let's do it this way. Can somebody, who's going to look that first one up? Can somebody look that one up? Somebody look up the second one, somebody look up the third, somebody look up the fourth. Okay? While we're doing that, um, let me keep going on this. Let's say that I want to... No, no, let's finish this. Look at the two corporate splits. There's sensing versus intuition. Sensing is doing stuff. Physical, movement, step by step. Intuition is jumping. It's thinking. It's abstract. Okay? What does it... Sensing, action. Intuition, words. The doer, the worker, the manager, the person in, in charge. What does that remind you of? Teacher and server. The server does. The teacher likes to work with words, with ideas. Okay? So we, again, we see something. This is like perceiver mercy. This is like um, um, teacher server. Introverted, extroverted. Introverted is simply in your head. Extroverted is simply outside in the world. So the extroverted person is driven by his world. The internal person, introverted person is dri driven by his thoughts. Those are the four basic characteristics of Myers-Briggs. Okay. Versus. Who's got Jeremiah 31, 33? Uh, Thank you. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their mind and write them in their heart. I will be their God and they will be my people. Thank you. So there's a new covenant. 
which is God will write his law, facts, thinking, on our hearts, feeling. So what does the Bible say about this category? It should be unified. Is there a split between thinking and feeling in our present world? Yes. Is it huge? Yes. In the Western society, this is the iron curtain. Don't dare touch bridge head and heart. Otherwise you get... That's America, especially North American society has decided that head and heart must not meet. Okay? If you're thinking, you will be objective. If you're subject, if you have feeling, you don't, you don't, it's not logical. Okay? That's, I suggest that this is the huge split in Western society. And what does God say? The New Covenant integrates that split. So what do we know about the New Covenant? Hmm. Interesting commentary on that. Hmm. Okay. Uh, next verse. Who's got Colossians 3, 22 and 23? Read it nice and loudly, please. Yes. Bond servants obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not <coughs> to men. Thank you. So what does this say about fun and work? You're supposed to find your fun in your work. They're supposed to be integrated. Now, are they in today's, free, in today's society? No. You work during the week and you have your fun in the weekend. Okay? You, do your, you do your work stuff at work and you do your personal stuff at home. Again, it's a real split. So, is this an accurate description of society? Yes. It's a good model. Is it a description of hardware or software? Software. Because the Bible says we need to change it. We need to integrate it. It's, not, it's basic, but it's not fundamental. It's something that can be changed. What does it take to change it? Death and resurrection. Dying to self. Coming apart and coming back together at a higher level. Is it easy to change? No, it's stinking hard. It's really difficult. Probably the most difficult thing you'll do is getting those splits together. They are basic, but you're supposed to put them together. That's what the Bible says. Now, there is an order to these two. Okay, let's say I want to, let's say I go to university and I learn all about engineering. I learn all about the world. I'm an engineer, by the way. That's my background. Um, you learn everything about the world, but you learn nothing about your own feelings. Now, how do you think you're going to get excited about your work? How, how are you going to find fun in your work? When your whole expertise has nothing to do with your personal life. How on earth are you going to integrate them? Impossible. Do you understand? Okay, so you, if you integrate it, you have to do it in a certain order. You have to start with thinking, feeling. That's number one. Once you have integrated that one, once you know facts about your feelings, once you have acquired an expertise, knowledge that includes your personal life, your emotions, then you have the tools to, be, to, to love your work. Because work, which is expertise, is tied together with love, which is feelings. You see? You have to do this in a certain order. Okay. Now, that's what I'm saying here. You can't love work if you only have objective facts. Next thing, two corporate splits. Okay, Matthew 23 and verse 25. You are so careful to polish the outside of the cup, but the inside is foul with extortion and greed. Okay. Um, see, that one's talking about, maybe I got it flipped. 
That one's certainly talking about inter introverted and extroverted. Um, it's also the whole thing about saying one thing and doing another. Okay? We know from Scripture that we're not supposed to do that, that what we say and what we do are supposed to be the same thing. They're supposed to say along the same line. Now, interesting. What did Jesus do? Everything he did was what he saw the Father doing. He was the living Word. He integrated those totally. Right? Now, okay, maybe let's see if the other verse, maybe I got them flipped. Um, let's, uh, Matthew 10, 26 to 28, please. Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. And what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetop. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. But rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Thank you. Okay, so these are right. Um, with sensing and intuition, the idea is with the Pharisees, the hypocrites, where they would say one thing and do another. Here, it's the whole thing of, it's saying very clearly, what's inside will be revealed. There will come a time when these two will be integrated, when what's inside will be expressed externally. It will come. They will be integrated. Imagination and reality. They will be to come together. Hi. Are these major splits in society between labor and management? Is that a big split between those who talk, jump to the goal, who, who tell others what to do, and those who do the actual action going step by step? Is that a split? Huge. Introverted and extroverted. Is there a discrepancy between what other people see about us and what's inside? Ma it's incredibly big. But are we supposed to integrate it? Yes. Okay. Again, um, it, okay, praise of God versus praise of men. You know, what's the difference between praise of men and praise of God? Men see the external. God sees the heart. Men only see when they're in front of you. God sees you all the time. Hmm? So you, praise of God versus praise of men really is a difference between internal and external. Now, again, you have to start with this one and do this one next. Thinking, feeling comes before perceiving, judging, if you want to integrate. I suggest in the same way, you have to integrate sensing and, intu intu and intuition before you integrate introverted and extroverted. Okay, let me explain why. Let's say I want you, I'm, I'm going to say, I want you, your imagination to be only like reality. I want it to be a complete integration between what's happening inside and ex ex outside. Well, if your imagination is always jumping from here to there, but when you're acting, you have to go step by step, how on earth are you going to get the two connected? Impossible. But if you allow your imagination, your words, your speaking, your, your, your theorizing to be guided by what you do, by your actions, now you've finally got a control on your imagination that will allow you to get the exter external and internal words connected together. Okay, let me give, that's a kind of an abstract concept because left hemisphere is a lot harder for people to work with because that's is not the natural emotion. It's the, it's the school emotion. This one's easy to, to get around, our heads around. Okay, let me give you an example. Let's say you're a painter and you paint nice paintings. That's an action. Eventually, you will think that all the world can be explained by your painting. That's called the artist. He thinks he's painting intuitive, great concepts with his action of painting. Do you see how your actions seed your thinking? The plumber will think will solve the world's problems in terms of plumbing. The chemistry prof, in terms of chemistry, to see you always, in terms of what you do, affects how you think. 
If, you, if your actions are twisted, your thinking will be twisted. If your actions are pure, your thinking will be, will be pure. Your actions, your skills, do limit your imagination. I'll give you another example. You probably don't know. Has anybody heard of Richard Feynman? Hmm, okay. A Jew with a name like Feynman. But one of the most famous um, physicists of the, last, of the 20th century, he was the youngest guy to work on the atomic bomb in World War II. Uh, a real certified genius. He could solve the most incredible problems in his head with his imagination. He could solve problems about the external world in his head. How did he do it? He controlled his imagination. He only imagined the way reality worked. He would never imagine things that weren't possible in reality. Okay? Because he allowed his thinking to be controlled by the laws of nature, he acquired an imagination that was genius level. He was also a really clever guy. But there's an example of somebody who, in science, he wasn't a Christian, he was a pagan, but in science, managed to get these two together. Yes? Okay, that's magical thinking. Thank you. Um, what I'm trying to say is what you want to do is God says our, our thoughts are, all our thoughts are evil. You know, what does it say in Isaiah? Okay, you want to redeem your thoughts. You want to integrate the external world where you have to follow the laws of nature, where you have to obey reality, where you have to do things step by step, you want to integrate that with a mind which is hopping all over the place and is filled with who knows what sort of garbage. Okay? The only way you can do that is by first allowing your thinking to be guided by your skills. Learning, this is how the world works. This is, it can happen with, okay, this is how I make a cup, a cup of tea. Okay, this is how I get rid of a habit. Okay, this is how God wants me to work in this situation. As you learn, you become righteous in action, your thinking will start to go along certain channels. And that's the tool that you can use to control your thoughts. It's a... You see, this, I, I, again, this is hard to explain because this is left hemisphere stuff. Okay? Normally what happens in a society is we... Okay. Okay, learning a skill. Yes. Whenever you learn a skill, it will guide your thinking. That happens automatically. Yeah, your thoughts are absorbed in your skills. That's right. And they're directed along your skills. All I'm trying to say is you handle this one before you handle that one. Okay, I'm trying to get that across. Now, the next thing I want to get across is the world we live in is one in which this has been integrated externally. Sensing and intuition have been externally integrated. I'll explain this in a moment. And thinking and feeling have been separated internally. Okay? We have, as a group, we have tackled this one. As individuals, we have avoided this one. Okay, let me explain. First of all, avoiding this as individuals. In Western society, like I said, head and heart do not connect. Everywhere you look, there is a separation between, what, between facts and feelings. You must be objective. Okay? If you have feelings, don't ever try to inject logic when a person is expressing feelings. He will get very mad at you. He will, he will call you judgmental. He will, you know, he will think that you're trying to impose rules on him, which is true, you are. Okay? My feelings are free of any sort of logical judgment. Okay? If I have a mystical experience, it's logic free. Because we split these as a society, thinking and feeling. That's what we do in Western society. I say Western because it's different in a place like Korea. Okay, now, think of technology and science. Science is intuitive. It's all these grand theories where you leap from A to B, going, leaping lightly from one, one 
idea to another. Sensing technology. You build something, machines, step by step by step. Our society, we live in a science and technology society. But we integrate that as a society. We have universities where you study science. We have factories where you build technology. It's all together, sensing and, and intuition, externally, as a society. But this one, as individuals, it's separate. The result is the corporate world has expanded massively. Organization works wonderfully. Huge companies, huge bureaucracies, huge government. The personal is shrinking to oblivion. There's no personal, almost no personal left in the West. There's no place for the individual. There's no place for individual feeling. The corporate growth has been combined with personal death. That's the result of tackling this one as a group and avoiding this one as individuals. We are paying the price with impersonal massiveness.